episode of Myeloma Crowd Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. I'm your host, Jenny Alstrom. We'd like to thank our episode sponsor for this uh, for their support of this program, Takeda Oncology. And as you heard in our last show, more myeloma progress means longer life for patients. This is a big blessing for patients and is exciting to researchers who are starting to use the word cure. Now, with more sensitive tests, researchers are now able to detect lower levels of disease. They are finding that these low levels can predict generalities about who will and won't progress and how durable remissions might be. This opens windows of opportunity to customize treatment, for example, who needs more aggressive treatment or who can stop maintenance therapy. We'll talk about these types of tests and the challenges that researchers face in today's show with renowned myeloma specialist, Dr. Ola Langren. Dr. Langren is a leader in minimal residual disease testing and myeloma. He has helped advance the field and knows how it can be successfully applied and advanced in myeloma. So, Dr. Langren, welcome to the program. Hi, Jenny. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great honor. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And I want to give a brief introduction for you before we get started, if you don't mind. Please go ahead. Dr. Ola Langren is Chief of the Myeloma Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City and Professor of Medicine at the Y.L. Cornell Medical College in New York. Prior to his appointment at Sloan Kettering, he treated myeloma patients at the National Cancer Institute for eight years and the Karolinska University Hospital in his home country of Sweden for two years. Dr. Langren is a member of the International Myeloma Working Group, board member and NCI representative of the Myeloma Steering Committee, part of the Hematologic Malignancies Program and the Clinical Investigations Branch of the NCI and the NIH, member of the Association of Medical Research Charities and board member of the CCR Clinical Research Strategic Planning Committee. He's received many awards, including the Director's Intramural and Intramural Research Award by the NCI, the NCI Bench to Bedside Award, and the American Society of Clinical Investigation Award. He has many, many open studies, particularly at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And Dr. Langren, in one of our first shows in 2013, you really pushed the idea that uh, and wondered why doctors were not treating with the goal of a cure or or treating with the idea that a cure could be found. And here we are several years later, and lots of people now are talking about a cure. Yeah, it's kind of interesting how things go, isn't it? You have to stick <laughs> yes. to living, and then you have to just keep on working hard. That's, I guess, how life goes. Yeah. Well, you are an expert in minimal residual disease, and that's the topic for our show today. So maybe you want to give us a broad overview of what minimal residual disease testing is and what it tells us generally. So minimal residual disease testing is is a terminology that has been used in several other diseases for quite some time. Uh, I think good examples could be, for example, the acute leukemias, and also, I guess, HIV is another good example. With the better therapies, uh, doctors have recognized that the amount of disease that the person could have in his or her body keep on shrinking, and using conventional uh, definitions for uh, a good response, which uh, in different diseases is defined a little bit differently, but usually called complete response, meaning that there is no disease detectable by those definitions. Although patients reach those complete response criteria, with more sensitive technologies, doctors found that there could still be some residual disease. So that kind of opened up this whole field of minimal residual disease detection. And over time, it was found that you can keep on pushing beyond complete response, and you, you go lower and lower, and Eventually, you will not find any disease if you have successful therapy in a given uh, assay. And studies have found in different diseases, including myeloma, that the outcome, the progression-free and overall survival, correlates with that depth of response. So it's really a way to measure how well uh, the therapy can get rid of the disease. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about MRD positive or MRD negative, maybe for those who aren't familiar with those terms, you can just, it's pretty clear what it might mean, but how you define that? The way MRD for multiple myeloma is defined, uh, that is based on a document that we wrote together in the International Myeloma Working Group and we published uh, mid last year, 2016. So we were all in agreement that 
uh, it was time to to put down the foot and say MRD has come to stay in the field of myeloma. So with that statement, we also had to define how to determine MRD positive negative in order for every study uh, to be consistent. So you can compare therapies from different trials uh, using the same endpoint. That's very important to have consistent uh, endpoints. So this criteria in this document I'm referring to says that one has to use a technology uh, and uh, that technology has to be sensitive to the degree that it can find one cell in 100,000. And it's based on bone marrow aspirates. So in practical terms, that means that the doctor will conduct or the nurse practitioner will conduct a bone marrow aspirate and you will take that sample and you will process it the standard way and it will now not only be uh, evaluated under the microscope and with conventional flow cytometry assays that are done around the world, you will also now expose that sample to a minimal residual disease assay that can find one cell in 100,000 evaluated cells. Uh, the document says that if, um, if you use a flow cytometry-based or you use what's called a DNA sequencing-based technology, Either of those two is fine, as long as the assay can find one cell in 100,000 or better. The consensus is, when it comes to flow assay, that if less than 20 cells have the features of being suspiciously abnormal, if it's less than 20, you still call that negative. And that's because of the nature of the cells that it can sometimes be very difficult to distinguish a normal from an abnormal cell. So it's actually not a matter of finding zero versus finding one, the threshold goes at 20. And it comes from extensive work in other diseases as well. Uh, so that's kind of where the cutoff is. When it comes to the sequencing, uh, you use uh, readouts from, from uh, what's called VDJ sequences. So you don't count cells, you count, count DNA sequences. And you have to have a baseline sample, and then you profile all these so-called VDJ sequences. And every B cell in the body has its own uh, VDJ sequence. The B cells are part of the immune system. And uh, the reason there is a big range is because we are constantly exposed to a lot of things in our bodies, things that come from the inside and things from the outside of our bodies, from the environment. So the immune system needs to be very, very broad and, and flexible. If you look at the myeloma uh, population in a, in a patient, amazingly, every cell virtually seems to have the same VDJ sequence. There is a lot of genetic heterogeneity uh, across the tumor cells, but when it comes to the sequence of what's called VDJ, that particular region in the genome seems to be virtually identical in every cell in a given patient. It differs from patient to patient, but in the person it is. So if you do the baseline and then you treat and you take out cells and you run that assay again, if you no longer can find any such excess uh, copy number, or more, more copies of that VDJ that you found in the beginning, then you can say it's MRD negative. And lastly, along these lines, the sequencing has probably a 10 times higher sensitivity. And that may not sound like a whole lot, but that means that you can rule out one cell in a million instead of one cell in 100,000. So it actually wow. is very, very sensitive. So that's, that's how you distinguish positive from negative. Mm -hmm. And you just do it, your baseline is before and after treatment, or after treatment, I guess you would say. Because so the there's nowhere we have testing, yeah. Mm-hmm. The sequencing, uh, because you are looking for these sequences for VDJ, which is a particular area in the human genome, uh, and that is being, uh, is being differentially used in different cells of the immune system. So you cannot really know if you have a person who has been successfully treated for myeloma. If you just take a look in that sample, if everything looks fine, uh, there are still some blips up and down, and some of those blips could be because there are normal cells going up and down. So you need to have a baseline sample in order to reliably say uh, that the clone that was there from the beginning is gone. So 
So the sequencing, mm -hmm. although it's more sensitive, one of the limitations with that technology is that you need to have a baseline sample. On the other hand, if you do work up to be begin with, you do a lot of other tests. So you, the doctor just has to remember to do that, so you have that available. And it can be done later if it was not done at diagnosis. It can be done um, if a person has a relapse, you could do the test, and then if you retreat, you can do the same thing again. So it doesn't have to be necessarily from the original diagnosis, but there has to be some disease in the, in the sample. Hmm. Interesting. So you know what to compare it to. So when you compare these two different kinds of MRD testing, um, which do you prefer, the flow or this DNA sequencing? Which which came out first, and can you give us a little bit of history about how they were developed? The, the early uh, work comes from the United Kingdom. Uh, the group in Leeds, uh, led by Andy Rostrom, who is a flow cytometry expert. He's a good friend of mine. They did this in the 1990s. Uh, the Spanish started copying their approaches, and they started playing with it, and they developed more uh, advanced flow cytometry, and they started seeing how many antibodies do you really need to put in the tube. Uh, so in very brief, when you look at the surface of a cell, any cell in the body, there are certain proteins that are expressed. And if you look at the myeloma cell versus a... Uh, and regular cell, let's say, in the skin, they have different signatures. If you look at the normal plasma cell versus a myeloma cell, which is an abnormal type of plasma cell, they are not identical either. The problem is that every person has a little bit of a different protein uh, repertoire on the surface, uh, uh, and that's true for, for myeloma cells. So every myeloma patient have different myeloma-looking cells. So you couldn't just have one marker and look for that and look in every patient and, and find the answer. So therefore you need to have a whole series of these markers. So what the Spanish found was that if you had one marker, that's not good enough. If you have two, that's better than one. Three, that's better than two. And then they kept on going and they were combining different antibodies back and forth. And they realized that if you have 10 antibodies, after a lot of work, and they found out which were the 10 best, that is better than 9, but when they went up to 11 and 12 and 13, it didn't seem to make a whole lot of a, of, of a difference. So they kind of said 10 is really what you need to have, and these are the 10. They did a lot of work on that. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem uh, with the work they did was that the machine they had could only read 8 at the same time. So they had to split the sample from the patient in two different tubes. So they took half the sample in one tube and half the sample in the other tube. So in the first tube, they took eight of their colors. And then in the other tube, they took the additional two. And then they took, again, six of the first ones from the first tube in that second tube. So you have eight. Mm -hmm. So every patient is being tested in two tubes, <clears throat> but there are ten colors. So if you run a laboratory, for example, with 2,000 tubes, uh, that could either be 2,000 patients if you could do one, two per patient. But in this case, it turns out that you can only do 1,000 patients because each patient has to be two tubes, so which sounds kind of simple, but mm -hmm. the reality is that this is how they develop the technology. Mm -hmm. So a problem with that technology is that it's a lot of work and you have overlap with these antibodies. They're also quite expensive. So this is really what this Euroflow method is. So it's, it's very sensitive. It has figured out the antibodies, uh, and it has a lot of uh, data to back it up. It is not so easy to do in the laboratory. It's actually very difficult. Uh, and um, at this point, there are probably only five or six labs in the United States that really do it right out of all the laboratories. So it's like almost nothing. Mm -hmm. And I think in Europe, probably there are five or ten labs also. So I think the future for flow cytometry, I do personally think, and this is an opinion, I don't think that it's going to make it uh, as the final test. I think it has a lot of limitations uh, because it's practically very difficult. Uh, I think the sequencing technology uh, is very different. It, it's much more reproducible, and it's kind of easier to, to, to run in, a, in the lab. You can, you can have a kit. Uh, you take the sample, you extract the DNA, you put it in the kit, and you run it in the machine, and here's the data. It's much more simplified. 
At this point, unfortunately, there is no technology that is available for myeloma commercially yet, but there are a lot of companies that are developing these. So I think within a year or so, this will probably take off, and it's just going to keep on going. That's what I think. So if I were to get MRD tested today, it's most likely just the flow because the DNA really isn't available. Are people using that in clinical trials, though, the DNA sequencing? So flow is really the only thing that's available. The problem is that uh, Mm -hmm. the the technology flow uh, has been invented since the 70s or 80s. It's very Mm -hmm. old technology. The problem is really to follow all these steps and to do everything that was kind of proposed in this model by the Spanish group, the Euroflow, uh, mm-hmm. that is not followed in most laboratories. There is a lot of uh, uh, variation, unfortunately. Uh, but yes, if patients go today, that's usually uh, what's done. Uh, they try to either replicate that or do some other homegrown model. Uh, sequencing is not yet commercially available, but once that happens, my prediction is that that is going to take the whole uh, field forward. Mm-hmm. Because it's a more sensitive test. Now, does either one of these are they measuring quantity only, or do can you measure the type of myeloma? So I know myeloma changes over time. You said a patient will have different kinds of myeloma, different proteins, or different clones. I guess people call them sometimes. Does it measure the type of clone, or is it just measuring quantity of cells? So VDJ uh, is a particular region in the genome. Uh, If you have um, a person with multiple myeloma, you do what's called whole genome sequencing. You capture all the DNA information, or you Mm -hmm. do uh, targeted uh, areas. You could either do uh, the exomes, or you could even do customized exomes. You could do subset of the exomes. However you do it, you, you will see that each and every person with a new diagnosis of myeloma probably has at least 10 different clones at diagnosis. This is true for every patient. Every clone has different mutations. For reasons that we don't fully understand, in each and every clone, the VGJ sequence seems to be virtually the same in every cell in a given person. But between people, the Crazy. VGJ is different. Yeah. But in that person, it is. So if you use VDJ for MOD testing, you cannot study the diversity of the disease. You will only be able to track if it's there or not with the limitation of the sensitivity. And if it's there, you can, you can translate that into quantitative measures, say how many copies you find, which you can use to predict the volume of disease. For flow cytometry, these 10 antibody colors I mentioned, they... Uh, are not exactly expressed on the surface of every cell across patients or within a given person. They are not uh, uh, linked to that genetic heterogeneity I'm referring to. So if you do this sequencing I mentioned and you do flow cytometry, even if you split the sample in many uh, subsets, each and every uh, subset of disease genetically do not have different uh, protein markers. They could have identical same protein markers, uh, although they are genetically different. So mm. so when you say follow subsets of disease, you can, you can follow whatever subset you see, but if you're after the genetics, then flow is not going to do the job. Uh, but maybe flow is good enough, maybe sequencing is good enough. My gut feeling is that if we can drive down the disease to it not detectable with a very sensitive assay such as sequencing VGJ, if there still is residual disease, if we took that out, we could then sequence those residual cells and see what they are like. That is technically mm-hmm. possible. It, it's not easy, but it's possible. Mm-hmm. We yeah. are working well, on I think type of assays. You're working on those types of tests? Yes. Hmm. Interesting. Well, earlier you mentioned the the International Myeloma Working Group guidelines that were changed last year. Do you want to explain what those changes were and what, what what are the current MRD guidelines? Up till uh, mid-2016, the deepest response that was in the 
response criteria by IMWG, which are the consensus criteria for evaluation or response on clinical trials, it used to be what's called stringent complete response. So that meant that the M spike should be gone if the patient had an M spike. That's true for 80% of myeloma patients. Uh, if you did a bone marrow, you should have less than 5% plasma cells in the bone marrow. If you did flow cytometry on top of that, you shouldn't be able to pick up any abnormal cells even if they were less than 5%. And if you didn't do flow but you stain for what's called kappa lambda, you shouldn't see any abnormal patterns there. And on top of that, if the light chains were skewed to begin with, they had to be normalized. That would be the same astringent complete response. So what became evident over time was that in that group of patients, if they had just reached that level of response, depending on if they just barely reached it or if they really were much deeper responders than that, you, you obviously wouldn't be able to distinguish that if you only use these markers, but you could theoretically think that the response went really deep beyond that threshold. So mm -hmm. when people started using these assays with flow cytometry, they saw there was a gradient, people that were positive or negative. So therefore, the International Myeloma Group criteria said that let's move uh, the bar beyond stringent complete response. Let's now set MRD negativity as the highest level of response. So the criteria are the following way. Number one, first, complete response has to be established. So you need to rule out the, uh, the M spike, and you need to do bone marrow showing less than 5% plasma cells. Second, now you take that aspirate and you run an assay that can find one cell in 100,000 or more sensitive. So you could either do the mm -hmm. flow or sequencing. So if you do either of those two and the test is negative, now you can declare MRD negativity. So that's the criteria. So basically complete response and a test can rule out one cell in 100,000. The criteria also have two other aspects in this uh, document. Number two is that for patients who were worked up for baseline who did a PET-CT, if there were areas that had that normal FDG uptake, meaning that they were hot, in areas where there was bone involvement that could be seen by CT. If you treat that person and the person is now in complete response, you do that assay of the aspirate and you conclude it's MRD negative the way I described it. You can first of all say the patient is in MRD negative state. If you now repeat the PET CT, if those areas that were PET positive no longer are PET positive, the SUV has normalized, you could now say that not only is the person MRD negative, the person is also PET-CT uh, MRD negative. There is less information known what that really means. Uh, there are all some smaller studies saying that the PET-CT also uh, has uh, some impact on the outcome. What's known uh, from MRD in the bone marrow is that it clearly, strikingly correlate with both progression-free survival and overall survival. For PET-CT, it's less uh, well described, uh, and there are also a lot of technical problems with PET-CT. It has a lot of false positive and false negative. So PET-CT, mm -hmm. I personally think, is not really as well developed, but it was still put in that document. Uh, we had a lot of discussion. Uh, whether it was appropriate or not, and the people who felt it was, they they were in majority, so therefore we put it in. But I, we also put language in and said that there's more work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. The last thing is that we had a lot of discussion on the value of repeating MRD testing. So going back to that first part of these two, when I talk about the bone marrow-based MRD and the PET-CT component on top of it, we were all in agreement that the bone marrow test was very important to, to, to declare MRD negativity. So to build on that, we agreed to have the third out of the three parts in the document. So sustained MRD negativity was added. The way we defined that in the document was that if you repeat uh, the bone marrow test and you look for MRD status, 
If you do that at least one year later, you can then say that you have sustained MOD negativity. We also said to follow up on that, that if you do it, let's say, after two or three or four or five or whatever years, you could say that at two years, the sustained MOD negativity rate was this or that many percent in a study, or at five years, you have this rate of MOD negativity being sustained. So that really mm -hmm. summarizes the whole document. Okay. Well, I think um, just to give people some context about why this is so important, and you'll do a better job than this, but so when you create these clinical trials, you're trying to determine at what point you can call someone either progression-free survival or overall survival, complete response, you know, very good partial response. These are some of the measurements that you use today. And um, what you're saying is you're looking for different and more sensitive criteria to be able to, in more detail, separate patients out so that you can see deeper levels. For example, like what you just said, um, you know, if somebody's two or three years out MRD negative compared to somebody who was in a MRD negative status for six months or something, um, Maybe you want to just describe a little more how how you'll be how you could see using MRD status as a clinical trial tool. So what is already implemented in this international myeloma working group guideline is that any clinical trial that is written around the world that focuses on patients with multiple myeloma, that study if that study is following the rules, that should use these criteria to describe how well the therapy works. That's, that is not a, a kind of a, there is no option there. It's like you have to do that as, a, as an investigator. You cannot write the protocol and come up with your own criteria. That's not right. And mm -hmm. the companies have to also use these criteria. So whenever you look, if you look, for example, if you give therapy for four cycles and you evaluate how patients on a trial have responded, these are the criteria you have to use. You have to say partial response, very good partial response, complete response, stringent complete response, or MRD negativity rates. These are the criteria. Mm -hmm. If you do it at one year or two year, this, this is kind of the law quote uh, for clinical trials. There is no penalty, there is no one who's gonna enforce any you know, penalties, but investigators will say this study was not done right. So no investigator mm -hmm. would deviate from that. They will always do that. We have all agreed to do it, to make it consistent, to allow comparison across studies. It's very important. So that's how that goes. But the question that I think also come up uh, in the head of both patients and doctors and, and families and others, I do think could be, for example, for a person who is not on a clinical trial, if he or she is MRD negative, how does that impact that person? And how could that potentially impact the, the treatment? So now these are new questions that are not regulated in these documents. So I see these a lot in my clinic. I see very many patients myself. And we have a very active program here at our institution in New York. So what we have done is that we have implemented MRD testing for every patient who comes to us. So we took the Spanish model and we uh, installed a machine that can read all the 10 colors in one instrument. And then we built a single tube 10 color flow. Hmm. So we made a decision uh, uh, almost three years back now that we're gonna do this for every person. It's gonna be part of our standard of care. So we treat patients and we check the blood test. If the M spike becomes negative, uh, we will do bone marrow tests and we will always run these tests. So when we started seeing the data that was generated by the others and we looked at the data that, that we generated internally, we felt that if we could rule out MRD negativity after six cycles of combination therapy in a new, newly diagnosed patient, we felt that it was very reasonable to collect the stem cells and to offer the patient to either get the transplant with maintenance or to keep the stem cells and go right to maintenance. So that's a very bold move to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. 
So we feel, based on the data that has been generated worldwide among our colleagues and internally here, that there is really there is no clear-cut benefit to the degree that we have to mandate uh, the transplant in this setting. We think it's still a valid option, but we mm -hmm. feel that there is no survival benefit from all the data, and there probably is no progression-free survival benefit either. But it is not from randomized phase three trials, but from the studies that have been generated, all the data points in the direction that for people who reach that degree of, of response after combination therapy, that, that the therapy itself may not be as important as the depth of the response. If you reach that deep response with whatever therapy you, re you, you got to reach it, that's all that matters. So it's MRD is more important than the therapy. So we and, let and patients is it more make the decision than, themselves. Oh, okay. And is it more important than the duration of it? Like, like let's say somebody has six cycles and then they become MRD negative and um, they stay that way for a year versus two years or three years. Have you dug a little more into it to see if um, you've just found that comparatively every, everywhere from the data that you're talking about? Or have you gone to say, you know, depending on how long they stay in that MRD negative status, it has an impact? Does that so make there sense? Are multiple, there are very many questions, and we don't have all the answers to all the questions. So the answers that we have, uh, well, the questions that we have answers to are, is MRD important? And the answer is yes. It seems to correlate with yeah. longer progression for interval survival. We have published on that. We have that in studies that we have ongoing also. Other groups have the same, exact same results. They're identical results. The, the data I'm mentioning, uh, there is no randomized phase three trial to prove what I just said at this point, that MRD is more important than therapy. But looking at the data, our interpretation, our expert uh, uh, interpretation of the data is that that is a reasonable uh, conclusion. So when we treat patients, we, we do a test after six cycles, and if they are MOD positive, we counsel them towards transplant. If they are negative, we give them the option to decide. And every patient will see both a transplant doctor and a myeloma doctor. And we, we don't have the ultimate answer, but for patients who choose to collect the cells and keep them in the freezer, we will put them on maintenance therapy. And I can mm -hmm. just descriptively tell you that we have very we, we have a very large program. We have several hundreds of newly diagnosed patients coming to us every year. Right. The patient seems to have MOD negativity for very many years with either of these approaches, as far as we have seen so far. But that's the great. Future, what uh, amazing information! The future will tell. Uh, and now, there are a lot of questions that, of course come after you address one thing, you can ask new questions. So is that true for every person? It may not be true for every person. So is it true if you have high-risk disease or standard-risk disease? I think it may have different implications, but we have also seen that there are patients that have what people refer to as high-risk disease that do equally well once they are MRD negative. It doesn't seem to, to really matter as much but it may not be the full truth. And there is no randomized study to answer the question at this point. So these are expert uh, recommendations, and, and patients are not being pushed in either way. They have the option to make their own decisions. And we, of course, help mm -hmm. them and work with the patients, but this is, this is where we are right now. Well, I think this is also, a great example. I think there are a lot no, of other ahead. questions that we are kind of facing. So for people who have been MOD negative for a long time, a question that many times come up, I have patients being MOD negative for five years. They never did transplant. Can I go off therapy? So I don't know. There is no randomized data at this point. There are patients that have opted to go off, and we have, we have some patients that have been off for about two years now. And to my knowledge with the exception of a handful of people, those patients remained MRD negative a few years out. So that is, of course, extremely very intriguing. 
I'm not saying that this is the way to do it. This is the final answer. I don't say that. I caution repeatedly and say we don't have all the randomized data. We are at the front of the knowledge, but the knowledge goes into the unknown. And we are just trying to to build on what we know. So we are very, very, very careful, and we are trying to follow this carefully. As a consequence, we are trying to develop blood-based tests because if you want to monitor safely, I think you would like to make sure that the MRD negativity stays negative. So we are quite far along with blood-based tests for MRD testing. Uh, so that would allow us to do much more frequent tests than if you normally would do a bone marrow. That's something that you probably wouldn't do every cycle or so. But the blood-based test could be done more frequently. So I think that's going to be majorly important going forward with blood-based MRD tests. That would be huge, just yes. huge. Because you could check it monthly or twice a month or something like that. Yeah. yeah. That would be incredible. And How long do you think it will take for, for those types of tests to come to, to either clinical trials or the clinic? Well, we we are working on it here internally. Uh, we are trying to, to get uh, grant support to develop these tests. Uh, unfortunately, it's it's quite cumbersome to do it, so we need to have people hired and we need to have machines and technology. So, unfortunately, everything that is involved when it comes to development comes back to, to grant funding. Uh, that's unfortunately how it goes. So, uh, I would say if we had like sufficient funding, uh, we could probably have these assays in, in one or two years, uh, for sure, very far along. Uh, with the current development rate, it may be more up five years or something. I don't really know. Something mm-hmm. like that. I wish it was faster. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. And um, I know that you talked about becoming neg- MRD negative is the goal. Um, you can be MRD negative but progress, and then you can be MRD positive but hold steady. So in your practice and in the data that you've seen, what does that mean? So I, I don't want patients to be really nervous if they're MRD positive, but they hold that for a long period of time or, you know, or be ne- MRD negative. And like you were saying, you have to be very careful about stopping treatment and you're very cautious and you put a lot of thought into it before you stop treatment. Um, what's your opinion on both of those, MRD negative and positivity? Well, I think you ask very, very important questions here, Jenny. So all doctors who have treated patients for many years uh, with myeloma have seen that there are patients that don't necessarily have even a complete response. You could have, let's say, 0. Point, I'm making up an example here, 0. 0.4 grams per deciliter of an M spike. It could just be sitting there year after year after year. The person may even be on maintenance therapy, and the protein is there. All other labs are fine. The person is feeling great. It's almost like MGUS. So if you, in that case, said, oh, let's get rid of that protein, and you started doing very aggressive treatment, and you did a lot of things, um, I don't think that would be the right thing to do because it's really only that protein that's there. Everything else is fine. The person is feeling fine. All other labs are fine. Um, So that's one extreme. So we see people that could also be MRD positive like that. You could be MRD positive for years. Mm -hmm. So in practice, we have all these examples of people who have proteins or MRD positivity over long periods of time. That's a true statement. At the same time, if you just look across the board, if you have 1,000 patients and you treat them, and then you have, let's say, 500 of them are MRD negative and 500 of them are MRD positive, on average, the people that are MRD negative are going to have the longest progression-free survival. Within the group of those that are MRD negative, there could unfortunately be people who still do progress. And in that group of MRD positive, that could be people who have a stable MRD positive, like I just explained. So when we when we provide or when we deliver these statements that MRD negativity is associated with better outcome, these are averages. Right. So I do think really what happens is that we are 
we are approaching a dilemma, like when we exp are exposed to dilemmas in life in general, we approach them. We try to solve the problem. Uh, not always uh, do we reach the goal, but sometimes it turns out that even if we didn't reach the goal, that the outcome was quite good anyway. And that's kind mm -hmm. of how it goes. But I think that is not the same as saying, I'm approaching a problem here, I don't care. It doesn't matter because even if it's still there, it's the same outcome. That is not the same uh, same thing. So I think mm -hmm. you do your best, and that could be a little bit left behind, and that could still have the mm -hmm. same good outcome, but you always try your best. I think that's kind of how it goes. So there are two different kind of paths. Uh, you, you end up with the same results, but the approach is different. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. And um, I had a, another doctor say that when he was treating high-risk risk patients, it was more important for his high-risk patients to hit a complete response kind of with the standard criteria without MRD than it was for his average patients or standard risk patients to achieve a complete response because some of those could stay with a little bit of M spike or something for a long time, but it was more important for the high-risk patients. So when you're looking at MRD levels and somebody's positive, say, are you are you looking for just trends up or down and or people holding steady at certain levels? What is an indicator to you if somebody's MRD positive about the treatment that they need, like you said, you're offering stem cell transplant if they are MRD positive and then they continue on with treatment? Um, or how do you... Do you use that as a marker for, to know how much therapy to give, the level of MRD positivity? Or I guess then you're back up and, you know, if it gets too high, then you're into the regular testing, right? So at this point, there is no uh, randomized data to guide doctors how to do these things. So everything we're talking mm -hmm. about right now are scientific hypothesis, and these are things that are currently being tested in some clinical trials. And I do predict mm -hmm. it's going to be more and more focused on these questions. So there is no answer from randomized studies to answer all these questions you asked. They're great, great questions. So I think I, I cannot give any, any numbers or any firm results in the absence of data. Right, but okay. I think that the questions I see are, for example, a person who gets treated with combination therapy and has a very good response with MRD negative, do you need to go through additional aggressive toxic therapy or can you go right to low intensity therapy such as maintenance? That's the scenario I, I outlined. We made a decision at our institution to offer patients both and they can choose. So that's mm -hmm. an example of how you go from more aggressive to more mm -hmm. uh, gentle therapy right. if you want, right. if you are. For a person who is uh, MRD negative that turn MRD positive, is that something that should be viewed as an indicator that you maybe need to start thinking about retreatment? This is a new evolving area. Uh, we don't know. So there, there is some early data suggesting that if you convert, that maybe that could be a prodrome of a biochemical relapse, meaning that the M-spike will come back. And that could take another month or half a year or a year or something. It varies a lot. And if that happens, then that will continue to go up, and then eventually you may need to start therapy or you have start development of symptoms that will trigger you to, to start therapy if, you, if you're holding off. So these windows are not well defined. I think they probably range from a few months up to maybe one, two years or something. Studies need to be done, and I guess the studies need to not only look at how to put out the fire, but also, I think importantly, it's going to be much more focused on wellness, quality of life. Mm -hmm. You cannot just throw in a lot of toxic things and get rid of a protein. If the person feels fine, that is not necessarily right, at least not for every person. Uh, it has to be put in context there. So these are very important questions that need to be addressed both molecularly, clinically from the endpoint point of view, and also from a quality of life and wellness perspective, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, there's a lot to think about, and that's uh, it's very obvious to me that we need myeloma specialists in our corner. And I say this almost every show, <laughs> but I mean it. 
Um, I I just think the level of uh, sophistication that someone like you has versus someone that is treating, you know, 20 different cancers, they just can't know this level of detail. It's just, uh, I appreciate it every time I talk to um, someone on the radio show. So thank you for going to that level of depth in your expertise. It's amazing. Um, maybe you want to talk about um, how often MRD testing should be done and when, and, and is there any time where it's not useful or, or you shouldn't ask your doctor about it? The way the criteria uh, have been written, and those, these are the criteria I've I talked about mm-hmm. several times here today, they say that, first of all, the patient has to be in complete response. So that's a kind of a requirement for these criteria mm-hmm. to even be able to say MOD negativity. If, if someone has an M-spike or light chain disease circulating in the blood or in the urine, to do this test is not going to deliver MOD negativity. It will always be positive. It requires mm-hmm. complete response in order to even be a candidate to be MOD negative by the criteria. So I think a practical uh, answer is that make sure you are first in suspect the complete response, and then you check. Mm-hmm. Uh, the question you ask about how often you need to repeat or do you need to repeat, as I mentioned, there is the sustained MOD negativity that was in the criteria we, we wrote, and we said that you need to do it at least a year later. You cannot do it two weeks later and say it's sustained. It has to be mm-hmm. a time window, and we agreed to do a year. This is just how we agreed, and it could have been differently, but that's what we agreed to do. So for that reason, I think I think it's reasonable with the bone marrow-based test to offer people that are MOD negative to potentially check annually if the person wants to do it. I don't think mm-hmm. it's by far at all mandatory. It's not. And outside clinical trials, there is no mandatory uh, test at all, of course. In my clinical practice, mm-hmm. patients who come and see me, at our institution, we do MOD testing for every patient. It's built into our standard of care, and we have the best mm-hmm. technical assay set up. We do that. We treat them uh, for six cycles. We do that. If they're negative, they go on maintenance, or if they do transplant, then they do maintenance. After a year, we would, we would offer to do it again, and mm-hmm. in 99.999% of the cases, this is covered by insurance to do a bone marrow test. Uh, and once we do the bone marrow test, our standard of care is to use part of that sample and run our uh, MRD tests. So that's what we offer. We don't force anyone to do it, but we, we offer that here. Well, a lot of times you're getting the bone marrow biopsy anyway because you're trying to yeah. detect, you know, level of plasma cells and stuff. So right. um, so the only time you're, you're saying it's just not useful at all you, if you have active disease, whether that's in an, an M spike or you're seeing activity in the light chains? That's correct. So okay. if, if the light chains or the M spikes are elevated, uh, then there is no MRD to be talked about because it right. requires Right, you that. have something. Uh-huh. So, I mean, the link is really that those proteins come from somewhere and they come from the cells in the bone marrow. So if you see the proteins, mm-hmm. you already know there are cells in the bone marrow. If you don't see the right. proteins, then you go back and see if there are still cells, but there are too few to leak out enough protein so you can detect it. It's all about detection. Mm-hmm. And the assays, the flow assays, if you do them perfectly correct, uh, you can find one cell in 100,000. Our flow assay mm-hmm. can probably go in the range of one cell in 100,000 and close to one cell in a million. We have spent mm-hmm. a lot of time trying to calibrate that. Uh, the sequencing can go to one cell in a million. Uh, we don't know if you go deeper, if that's going to continue to to correlate with better outcome. Uh, that's where we have our blood-based tests um, in development, and we are trying to improve on that. But that, mm-hmm. these are questions I don't know the answer to. And I know sometimes patients will see little blips on their, um, like a light chain number will go up or and then back down or something like that. If you're doing the MRD and it's positive and you have some of that light chain stuff going on, is that an indicator that, like, if you repeated an MRD test and it was positive once because there's a blip and it goes back down, 
will will like an increase in the MRD positivity status indicate that there's disease growth? So the light chains because it's are, more sensitive than the light chains. So the the first part of your question here. So the light chains are extremely uh, volatile. They are not stable uh-huh. at all. Um, mm-hmm. If you check the light chains in a healthy person every 10 minutes, it's going to show different numbers. If you check it in the mm-hmm. patient with myeloma, it's going to show different numbers. If you show it in someone mm-hmm. in complete res- response, complete remission with myeloma, it's going to show different numbers all the time. Light chains are flying mm-hmm. around all the time. If mm-hmm. you have an infection, that will drive up the light chains. If you walk around, if you eat, if you drink fluid, if you do things, the light chains will go around. If the kidneys are busy uh, filtering blood, the light chains will go up and down. The light chains are very, very unstable. So a blip up and down means absolutely nothing. The first thing to do is to just recheck it. And if it's normal again, then forget about the blip. It was nothing. Light chains Mm. are not reliable. If you see there's a trend that they keep on going up, that's a whole different thing. But the blip Mm -hmm. has absolutely no impact. Mm. The first thing is to That's always the case. And there are a lot of other diseases. Uh, I've done research when I was at the NIH in many other disease areas, such as various autoimmune diseases. I did research in HIV in, in the context of these proteins. You actually can see very high levels of light chains in people with HIV. You see it with different types of autoimmune diseases, uh, with different types of other genetic immunological diseases. We found it. And people who underwent organ transplants and things like that. The light chains mm-hmm. are absolutely not myeloma specific. They are associated with immune dysregulation or activation also. Okay. Uh, Interesting. When when the if the light chain go up if you are MRD negative, that doesn't mean that MRD went away. I would just recheck the light chain. Uh, and if that's normal, nothing has changed. Uh if you see someone being MRD negative turning MRD positive is that something that could be kind of a blip also? Well, we know much less about that. I think if the person is on maintenance, it's possible that it could go away. Uh, uh, if it is in a person who is outside maintenance, if it goes from negative to positive, I have so far not seen it going away, but I, I'm sure that there could be instances, uh, at least if it's very low level, if it's just around mm-hmm. the threshold of the sensitivity. Mm-hmm. Interesting. But there is well, very little data. Okay. Yeah. It sounds like, I mean, you're learning as you go, right, as you gain experience with patients and as these tests progress and become more sophisticated and more capable. So I'm thrilled you have a test where you can do it in one tube. That's great. Um, how would a patient ask their doctor about getting an MRD test, and what would you suggest that they that they ask for? Well, so um, as I mentioned, there are not very many centers in the country that that do uh, testing at this point. We did a survey where we asked the 30 leading centers in the country, uh, and we did the initial survey we did a few years ago, uh, about five years ago. Uh, And when we asked the 30 leading centers, at that point, this is five years ago, 11 centers said, yes, we do it. But then when we started going mm-hmm. through how they did it, only one of the 30 centers did it the way that the guidelines recommended. So that was kind of disappointing. Mm-hmm. Now we sent out that same uh, survey one more time, and we actually sent it to the same centers. And we thought maybe maybe people were thinking about it again because they were asked and they kind of knew that it was not that great. Uh, and I do think that there were five or six centers that now do it according to the guideline. But this is like the leading myeloma centers in the United States. We're yeah, talking. right. So, They're big. <laughs> they have hundreds and hundreds just like you. So there are very few centers that really do it, uh, at least if you mandate the, the, the guidelines to be right. And I think if you go to a place where they don't run the test the way it's supposed to be, you're very likely to be MRD negative, but that could be false negative because they don't mm-hmm. find the cells. We're talking about finding very low low amounts of, of disease. You really need to have right. calibrated all the assays perfectly right. So I think asking the doctor if they do MRD testing uh, 
if they don't, then that's just how it goes. That's the 99% of the cases, they don't do it. Uh, mm-hmm. If they do it, I guess ask where will the sample be sent and how will they be done. And I'm not sure if all the clinical doctors that don't spend any time doing research are fully aware. That I'm not sure about. I think that's something that I guess patients could ask. But please be aware that this is an area where there is a lot of development. So uh, it's not so easy for doctors that don't have access to these technologies to to offer it. It's unfortunately part of the kind of the, the evolution. I think in a few years it's going to be much more common. But for right now, patients have to be aware where to go if they really want to do it right. Right. And myeloma is rare anyway, right? So, I mean, there are large myeloma academic centers, but you're talking about a rare disease and then a brand new test that's still in development and maturing right. as it proceeds. So that's terrific. Well, um, I would like to open it up for caller questions and give people a little bit of time to do that. I know I've taken a lot of time myself, um, but we have a couple caller questions, if that's okay with you. Um, Our first caller is at 266-8175, so go ahead with your question. So I brought you online earlier in the show thinking you were Dr. Langram, but you're not. So um, call 2668. Oh, oh, you didn't have a question? Oh, you okay. You pushed something on your keypad. (laughs) So you can can call 347-637-2631 and press 1 on your keypad. Okay, 983-6757. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Langreen and Jenny. This is Dana Holmes. Happy New Year to you both. Dr. Langreen, I have a question for you. Is MRD testing subject to sample bias in the bone marrow as regular bone marrow biopsies would be? So that's a good question. So when we talk about sample bias, um, that usually means that uh, depending on how the test and the sample was collected and done, would that impact the results? So the answer is that yes, it is. Now, that's not unique to a lot of other tests. If you check uh, hemoglobin in a person who got uh, an infusion with uh, fluid and you draw blood, the hemoglobin would be false also. So there, every test we do could potentially be impacted by, uh, by things uh, that we also do. The variation for the MRD uh, evaluation is more sensitive than the example I gave, like if you just check the CBC. So the things that could quote, be wrong in an MRD sample could be that the person who does the bone marrow doesn't follow a predefined uh, protocol when they actually do the sample. So when the doctor has the syringe and the the marrow is being sucked out from the marrow, if it's not done right, there can be a lot of blood coming into the syringe, and the blood will then dilute the sample. So when you send over the sample to the, the laboratory, they will look through more blood than actual marrow. And then they say everything looks clear, but it's really because they're looking at blood and not marrow. So that's a problem. Also, there is less known about this, but you could at least theoretically envision that in a person who has been treated successfully for myeloma, if the tumor cells die off, there may still be some cells sitting in areas uh, that are not consistently spread out throughout the bone marrow. So when you put in the needle, if you happen to put the needle in an area where it has been clear, and then you you do all these tests, then you say it's negative. There could still be cells sitting elsewhere. So that's mm-hmm. something that there's really no way to overcome that with that technology. But independent of those factors, and there are other factors as well, the machines have problems. They can what's called lyse the cells and impact the cells uh, so you don't find them. They may break in the machine. There are other things as well. Independent of that, all the literature shows that being MOD negative is associated with longer progression-free survival and also with overall survival. So built in these problems, it still has a prognostic impact. So will, I do the, think the, will the blood um, biopsy overcome that eventually? Thank you for asking. I was just going to say, a, oh, way okay. to over, a way to overcome these problems, I guess, would be exactly what you say, to find another way of, of looking for it. 
So I have worked on MOD assays for, I think, eight or more years now. Uh, we have spent a lot of time thinking about it. We have worked in the lab. We have done very many uh, analyses, and we keep on working. We are more active now than we have ever been in the past working on these different assays. Uh, we have been able to extract DNA from the blood, and we have found the same signature in the blood as you can see in the marrow. We have found out a diagnosis, so we could actually see exactly the same as we saw with the biopsy in the blood. That's pretty neat. The problem is when we treat, the amount of DNA goes down very, very much, which is certainly a good thing. We kill the cells. So if we have problem finding those last cells in the bone marrow, because we start off with much less DNA in the blood to begin with, it's going to be even more difficult to find it in the blood. So it becomes practically very difficult to find DNA in the blood. And even if we have looked for single cells in the blood, that is also not easy to do. So what we're doing now is to see if we can actually find proteins that have been produced by the cells in the bone marrow that they leak out in the body, and then we can track those proteins in the blood. Instead of looking for DNA from uh -huh. individual tumor cells, each cell is capable of producing a lot of protein. So there is more protein than they have DNA inside themselves. So Amazing. It's just amazing. It's like building a pyramid. <laughs> so that's not what we are doing. And I can tell you, we, we don't have the final results, but we have done what's called dilution series, where we have diluted uh, the samples, like millions uh, or more, uh, from, from what we started off. But we still can't find these proteins. So we are very hopeful about that, but we don't have the final results. Well, Dr. Langreen, what would it is it going to take to to get MRD testing to be standardized? Because, you know, I, Jenny and I are active in these online myeloma groups, and we do hear patients say that they had MRD testing, but they really don't know to what level. Um, you know, if you ask them, well, what kind of testing, nobody really knows. So, it, it you know, it doesn't sound like we're even close to comparing apples to apples when, um, you know, you have these discussions. So how do you overcome that? I think it's actually, I don't think it's that complicated, but I think it's, there are a few practical things that need to happen. So I think when the sequencing-based assays become approved by the FDA, that will be the first step. That will take away all the problem with flow cytometry. Flow cytometry will, in my personal opinion, never make it. It will not happen. So when the sequencing tests come, uh, that will be the first thing. And then the implementation of this in clinical practice will be the next. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we are about one to two years away from these things coming into full clinical practice. Until that happens, unfortunately, uh, only patients who live nearby centers that can offer it or patients who travel to those centers will be able to be tested reliably. This is unfortunately how it is. It's kind of a supply-demand dilemma right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, and my last question to you, I don't want to take up all the time, is from a smoldering uh, myeloma patient standpoint. Do smoldering myeloma patients have a better chance of reaching and maintaining MRD negative with earlier treatment? Um, and would that be related to the fact that their disease may not have yet mutated to a very complex level? So there's much less known about uh, that. So what's known about, in very brief, MRD in different stages of disease? So the highest degree of MRD negativity comes from the study we did at the NCI. We published that in 2015 in JAMA Oncology. And the MRD negativity rate in newly diagnosed patients, if you use 10 to minus 5 sensitivity, was in the range of about 60%. So 60% of patients have no detectable disease with the uh, sensitivity of the International Myeloma Working Group criteria. What's known in the setting of relapse disease? There was a presentation at ASH in December in San Diego. They showed uh, with the use of daratumumab, revlimid, and dexamethasone that the MRD rate was 25% in people with one to three prior lines of therapy. This is in the relapse setting. In smoldering myeloma, there is much less known. 
again, the NIH study is the only study that has information at this point. And that's simply because you need to have powerful therapy. Uh, and the first randomized study that was done for smoldering was the Spanish Revlimid dexamethasone versus no therapy. Mm-hmm. And Revlimid dexamethasone is a very weak regimen, so you don't have MRD negativity uh, with that therapy. So it was kind of not meaningful to do it. So the NIH study used cofilzomib Revlimid dexamethasone. And that study showed 100% complete response and it was in the range of about 95% MRD negativity, mm. 10 to minus 5. Mm-hmm. So those are the studies. But these are small studies. That study so far has only enrolled uh, 18 patients or so. So the mm-hmm. numbers may not be precise. They are not precise. But these, these are the rates that we, we have based on data in the literature at this point. Are certain um, molecular subgroups more likely to reach MRD negativity, or is it just really based upon the the, the, the treatment? I think all those uh, factors matter. I think the treatment majorly impacts. Uh, the study that I was referring to for the relapse setting uh, with daratumumab, revlimid, dexamethasone, they broke down the MRD uh, cases in relation to what they refer to as standard risk and high risk. And only in patients with high risk did they see MRD negativity if they were treated with daratumumab, revlimid, dexamethasone. None of the high-risk patients that were treated in that randomized study with revlimid, dexamethasone alone reached MRD negativity. Mm -hmm. So the therapy is important. Mm -hmm. Second, as I pointed out also as part of this example, it seems that the biology of disease is also probably important. And thirdly, as I also indicated, if you look at newly diagnosed in the relapse and in the small ring setting, the rates go up in earlier disease. Mm-hmm. So probably the amount of disease, so early, not aggressive disease treated with optimal therapy, you are more likely to have high MRD negativity rates, which mm-hmm. I guess makes quite logical sense. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Langreen, for your time as always. Um, find us a cure. <laughs> We're counting on you. Well, we are, we are doing our best to try to improve. It's not easy to do these oh, things. But it sure I, doesn't I am, sound it. We, we are very excited about uh, all these things I'm talking about, and I do think that um, uh, the future looks extremely bright for people both with smoldering and with multiple myeloma. Uh, there is more work to be done, and we, we, we work as hard as we possibly can. Well, thank you for everything that you and your group does. It's, it's exciting to hear about it, and it's, um, it gives patients hope. So thank you for that. Have a thank great you. day, everyone. Jenny, thanks for taking my calls. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Well, Dr. Langram, we're just so thankful that you joined us today. Your work is just truly incredible. And um, I'm just so thankful that you're working on our behalf and for all you do. So thank you for joining us today and going into such depth with MRD negative, you know, MRD status, it's just so helpful to hear it straight from somebody who knows all the details. Thank you so much for having me, Jenny. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you again for having me. Oh, thank you so much for joining us. You're terrific. And thank you, thank you for listening to Myeloma Crowd Radio. Join us next time to learn more about what's happening in myeloma research and what it means for you. Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. (gasps) No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.